Thank you. In this presentation, we'll take a look at the use of cohesive clays for the stabilization of unpaved gravel roads. First, I'd like to acknowledge our partners and funders. Brand University, Cypher Environmental, who is our most important funder and supporter of this work, MyTax, Natural Resources Canada, NSERC, the Regional Municipalities of Cornwallis and Whitehead, City of Brandon, Blue Star Construction, Manitoba Infrastructure, and the Mining Industry Human Resources Council. For this presentation, I'll give you a brief introduction, and then we'll examine clay properties and clay deposits, so we have an understanding of how and why the process works. I'll take you through one of our road stabilization and construction projects, and then finally we'll examine some of the results, testing, and monitoring. Our project goals are to stabilize unpaved road surfaces and reduce maintenance to a minimum. Of course, we want to be cost effective and environmentally sustainable. Our big challenge and opportunity is to build safer, durable, long lasting roads with local materials, standard equipment, and simple technology that is available to everyone. Our project area is located in southwestern Manitoba near the center of the North American continent. The area straddles the edge of former Glacial Lake Agassiz. This is important because it controls the type of deposits that are present. There are either glacial lacustrian deposits formed at the base of the lake or glacial fluvial outwash. The project area outlined in red is shown in the map to the right. The red and green dots represent registered clay pits that were visited and sampled. An example of the scope of the problem, the road network in Manitoba and Saskatchewan comprises approximately 320,000 kilometers of roads, of which approximately 270,000 kilometers are not paved. These roads are a major social, environmental, maintenance, and financial challenge especially to those communities where the population base is very small. Environmental problems include airborne dust, chloride degradation and corrosion where it's used, vegetation and water degradation, aggregate depletion, which is becoming a greater concern in many areas, rutting, washboard, potholes, and other issues. As a solution, we use cohesive or reactive clays as one component of a binding or cementing agent. The second component are cationic polymers such as magnesium, calcium, potassium, iron, other positive ions, and also positive charged organic molecules. All are found in the natural environment, but are also added through the catalyst use. The structural framework is provided by a normal minus 3 quarter or minus 5 h inch aggregate with good particle size distribution, such as a typical A base. The process is accelerated by organic catalysts. We use Earthsyme, which is provided by Cypher Environmental of Winnipeg. The catalyst promotes the densification of the material and clay bonding. In order to understand how and why the process of clay binding works, we'll review some of the pertinent properties of clay minerals. Clays are tiny plate-like minerals. The crystals have diameters typically less than 5 microns and thickness as little as 3 nanometers. Many are essentially nanoparticles. They fill pore spaces and can help increase density. Clay minerals are sheet silicates. All minerals in nature must form with a balanced stoichiometry and be electronically neutral. Clays defy this rule by forming with excess negative charges that are distributed about the surface of clay particles. This occurs during mineral formation. 
whereby aluminum 3 plus may substitute for silicon 4 plus and tetrahedral structural sites shown in blue in the spinning diagram. Magnesium 2 plus and other low valent cations may substitute for aluminum 3 plus in octahedral sites shown in orange. The overall excess negative charge must be balanced by interlayer cationic complexes such as magnesium, calcium, and positively charged organic molecules. The excess negative charge on clay minerals is what gives them their tremendous capacity to adsorb and hold large amounts of water. The process of clay bonding is further illustrated in the diagram to the right. Clay particles are represented by the pinky beige plates. In order to achieve electrical neutrality, clays draw in, readily adsorb, and bond to the positive ends of polar water molecules and to the positive charged cations and organic molecules in solution. This creates a weakly bonded plastic material. As water is removed, clay particles are drawn closer together, and the electrostatic bonding force between clay and interparticle cations increases significantly. The electrostatic bonding force reaches a maximum when most water is removed. It is this electrostatic bonding of clay particles that can lock aggregate material firmly in place. In order to achieve maximum densification and binding, good particle size distribution is required, whereby all pore spaces are filled by progressively finer materials. The remaining microbes are then filled by ultrafine silt and micron and nanoscale particles of clay, as shown by the red matrix in the diagram on the left. The photomicrograph on the right is from a stabilized road. It shows sand and silt particles embedded and cemented in a matrix of ultrafine silt and clay. We can now turn our attention to the nature of clay deposits that are available for construction. Clay deposits are widespread in central North America, deposit at the base of glacial and other lakes, and in fluvial deposits. They're comprised of variable mixtures of silt and clay. The silt component is largely quartz, feldspar, carbonate, and mica, and made up 61 to 93 weight percent of the clay deposits tested in this study. The clay mineral content of Manitoba clay ranges from 7.5 to 39 weight percent for the 17 deposits examined. Overall, clay minerals make up less than 1% to greater than 50% of clay deposits. The plasticity index or relative cohesiveness in a moist state ranged from 0 to greater than 60. The photograph on the right shows a glacial varved clay deposit from Manitoba. The photographs on the right show four of the 17 clay deposits tested in this study. After removing the coarse material, the minus 75 micron or minus 200 mesh fraction was typically comprised of one third sand, one third silt, which is glacially pulverized to as small as micron and nanoparticles, and one third true clay, being comprised of illite, montmorillonite, chlorite, vermiculite, and kaolinite, all as micron to nanoparticles. In order of cohesiveness, or binding energy, the best clays are montmorillonite and vermiculite, followed illite and chlorite. The clay with the least binding energy is kaolinite. In fact, it is possible to have a kaolinite-rich deposit that is essentially inert and has no binding energy. These images show the nature of clay as it occurs in glacial fluvial deposits. Image A is a reflected photomicrograph showing that clay occurs as flocculated clots of silt and clay. Images B and C are taken with scanning electron microscope at higher magnification. In image C, we can see ultrafine 
angular shards of silt, which are caused by glacial pulverization, embedded in a fine clay matrix. The presence of the ultrafine silt is helpful to the construction process, as it helps with densification by filling pore spaces, and it helps to render the clay deposits workable during construction. Illustrated are scanning electron microscope images taken at high magnification. The left image shows natural clay-rich material that is both flocculated and untreated. The right image shows pit clay material that has been treated with the catalyst and compacted. The clay in this image is well bonded and illustrates what must take place in order to produce a well bonded road surface. We measure the relative binding energy and strength of clay rich materials by constructing compacted clay pucks in compaction molds. Compaction energy is applied with a proctor hammer or with a shop press using standardized parameters. The semiconductor compression strength of the clay pucks is then measured and recorded using a standard load frame. These diagrams show the results of semi-confined compression strength testing of the clay pucks. The diagram on the left shows increasing strength with increasing compaction energy reaching a maximum at 40 Proctor hammer blows. The diagram on the right shows increasing strength with increasing curing time, reaching a maximum after five to seven days. However, maximum strength can be achieved by continuous compaction during the curing process. This most closely resembles what happens in an actual road stabilization process. Now to understand the role of cohesive clays, we can walk through the construction and stabilization process. Step number one is to standard A base with a good particle size distribution, such as that illustrated in the upper right photograph and combine it with a high clay deposit, which has a high plasticity index. The material can be blended in a quarry, as shown in the lower left diagram. This requires a lot of testing. It includes particle size analysis to determine the correct blend. Atterberg's testing is carried out to ensure that the clay deposit has a high plasticity index and that the plasticity index of the final blend is 10 or more. Proctor tests are carried out on the final blend in order to determine optimum moisture content and we also carry out binding and bearing strength tests. Sufficient material must be blended in order to produce a compacted 6 to 8 inch wearing course on the road being stabilized. The next step is to scarify and shape the existing road that is being stabilized. Once a proper crown has been achieved, the material from the blended mix in the quarry is now wind road along one side of the road. Once all the wind road material is completed, then moisture tests are carried out on this material immediately prior to construction. The road can remain open during this process. The next step is to calculate the amount of water required to bring the new road material to near optimum moisture content. The required amount of water is added to a large water truck. A catalyst is added to the water and mixed. The water and catalyst are then added to the road material in typically three lifts, with the water truck depositing one third of its load into each lift. The next step in the process is to thoroughly mix the road material, water, and catalyst. This is accomplished by rolling the material with the blade of the graders back and forth across the road three or four times. Following homogenization, the road is ready for shaping and the compaction process begins. 
The main compaction is carried out with a large steel drum roller. The first pass is with vibration on, which is generally sufficient to create a hard, compacted surface. Additional passes may be carried out with vibration off, so long as it is apparent that the road surface is benefiting from the process. The final step is the surface seal. This is accomplished by slurring the surface with water, allowing it to soak in, and then compacting with the retires. This process may be repeated until the desired surface seal is achieved. The entire construction process for one mile of road takes one day. At the end of construction, the road is immediately open to traffic. The road goes through a curing process that may take up to about 30 days. During curing, residual moisture is removed and resultant pore space is sealed and compacted by the ongoing traffic. The road reaches its maximum strength densification after the curing period. The photographs at the lower left show a road surface upon completion and again five years later. After stabilization, the roads are tested and monitored. Nuclear densometer tests show that maximum dry densities are routinely achieved. The dynamic cone penetrometer is used to determine the California bearing ratio. In the 15 kilometers of road constructed in the Brandon area, the CBR ranged from 37% to greater than 200%. The CBR varies with the road material used, the construction methodology, weather, and traffic conditions. However, in all cases, bearing strength was sufficient to carry the heaviest of haulage traffic, including that from quarries and mines. These images show Lorry Road three years after stabilization. The stabilized wearing course is approximately six inches thick. It is comprised of A base with enough clay rich material to bring the minus 200 mesh fines content to 32 weight percent. Zach is shown here using a concrete saw to cut out slabs for testing in the lab. You can see from the profile that the road resembles concrete but it's not, it remains in a semi-ductile state and as such resists brittle cracking and fracturing and also retains some very interesting self-rehealing properties. The maintenance protocol for these roads requires once yearly scarification of the upper three to five centimeters, which is then reshaped and recompacted. After three years, the road remains in excellent condition. In summary, there are three components to the successful stabilization of an existing gravel road. This includes a moderate amount of engineering and test work, the correct materials and catalyst, and the proper construction protocols. In the Brandon area, the cost to stabilize roads varied from about 45,000 to 68,000 Canadian dollars per kilometer. If you wish further details about our work, you can refer to the TAC paper attached to this presentation, Cohesive Clays for Construction and Stabilization of Unpaved Roads. You can also refer to the Manual for Clay Stabilization of Unpaved Gravel Roads, Materials and Procedures, which is available from Brandon University or Cypher Environmental. Finally, I thank you all for joining in on this presentation.